discovered the orcs in a place not too far away, and with that explained. A few moments had passed. Shunan got to the island. He realized there were a few frogmen. That got there before him, and at the center of it was his father. Old Oloi had a solid build. But his whole body was covered in a layer of white mucus, which painted him a cobra scene. And he who couldn't breathe well was shaking, and in front of them was few young lizards tied. Up with a rope, and there was no doubt what Oloi's intentions were, and as the preparations were complete, Oloi called out to his god and offered the lizards to him, and prayed that he takes care of those lizards who are wreaking havoc in their village, and as they do this, a large shadow beneath the lake was now visible from afar. Meanwhile on the lizardman's side, the frogman's lower-ranked village was almost done with. No more frogmen challenged the lizardmen. The soil of the village had turned red from all the blood the frogmen shed, and Rakrak felt a sense of exaltation at the smell of wood burning and the pools of blood. Suddenly, Owen came running to Rakrak in such a hurry as if he was being chased. He was even at a loss of breath because of how far he ran without stopping, but Rakrak doesn't have a single clue why he did that. Maybe he was just excited or something, so after he praised him for a job well done, he asked Owen. What's the reason why he was running to him so urgently? Which Owen? Exclaimed that they need to go to the island in the middle of the lake right this instant. But this just confused Rakrak, and even though he knew that the frogmen at least had two more villages, he wasn't particularly in a hurry. They just had to keep up what they were doing now. And they would achieve victory. Moreover, the lizard men weren't hurt, let alone tired after their first win. They could go around the lake to destroy the other village at the crack of dawn. So he doesn't understand why Owen wanted to go to that little island, and so he asks if there is something on that island. To which Owen immediately replied that there are several young lizard men at that, and now they are going to sacrifice them as an offering to their god. And if they offer a sacrifice, their god will come and do them small favors. It won't be able to help cure the disease they have, but it'll likely attack them and his warriors, and Owen hoped his words would convey to Rakrak his feelings, but Rakrak just sighed, and told Owen that he should have told him that earlier. This shocked Owen, but before he could utter a response, Rakrak explained to him why he couldn't do what he suggested, and that is because his warriors chased after the frogmen just now, and were searching the shores. But most of the frogmen took boats, or were too good at swimming so they couldn't catch up and follow them, and he thought they would just go to the upper village, so he didn't order his warriors to secure any boats, and therefore they can't go to the island, but because Owen was driven by desperation, he proposed that they should swim, but he was just met with the glaring eyes of Rakrak because of how utterly ridiculous his suggestion was, and seeing that Owen's judgment was clouded by panic, Rakrak explained to him bit by bit why it is dangerous to swim to the island, and that is because the enemy have arrows and bows, making them vulnerable targets the moment they headed towards the island. Additionally, their swimming skills were not as proficient as their adversaries, and their ability to breathe efficiently in water was limited. This combination of factors increased the risk of them being attacked and overwhelmed in the water before they could even reach the island. But even with this, Owen couldn't grasp the reality he was now in. He was in denial, because his son is one of those to be sacrificed. So in a state of desperation, he pleaded to Rakrak once more. However, Owen's plea only ignited Rakrak's anger, and in a moment of fury, Rakrak struck Owen in the jaw and shouted Owen with rage, because he should have told it sooner. He should have trusted him sooner. He is confident that they can beat the god that these crude frogs believe in with their own strength. And if their god appears from the island and attacks them, he will show him that he and his warriors can destroy that thing they call god. Rakrak was angry, but Rakrak's emotions shifted to pity as he gazed down at Owen, because if Owen had told him sooner, even just a little sooner, he could have saved his son, and Owen didn't think Rakrak had said anything wrong. He agrees with Rakrak everything would have changed. If only he knew of Shunan's intentions just a little. Sooner, if only he trusted Rakrak before the fifth, the fourth, the third time they met. But perhaps, everything could have been changed even before he met Rakrak. It's just that he acted too late. 
and as Owen was in the middle of a mental breakdown, Jell and the other warriors came at the sound of Rakrak shouting, and since Rakrak's shout was so loud they had an idea what was happening. So they looked over to the small island, anticipating the appearance of the creature. And just as they expected, something broke the surface of the water. It was the two-headed fiend. And this sight instantly filled the frogman with joy. Alui, with the last of his strength, fervently praised the deity for heeding their prayers, elated by the presence of multiple offerings. For sacrifice. Alui's excitement was palpable. He implored their god to punish the lizard men for intruding upon the sacred lake, and amidst this chaotic scene, and amidst this chaotic scene, Owen could only watch from a distance, helpless, just like before, while Rakrak, on the other hand, was considering that maybe it's worth a try to fight the two-headed fiend, but he knew this challenge would be tougher than their previous encounters, as they lacked any topographical advantage and couldn't rely on clever strategies, so he was still hesitant as they may have to make some sacrifices in order to save those youngins, but before he could made up his mind, a familiar bluish light suddenly appeared, and turning to its source. It was indeed the blue butterfly from their god, and so Rakrak called for Owen's attention, and asks if he believes in miracle. Which was an odd thing to ask, but as he looked up, he realized that it was indeed a miracle. A godlike creature, just like the two-headed fiend just appeared before them. However, just moments before these events unfolded, once the two-headed fiend revealed itself. Nebula was delighted, as this was the type of fiend that he was familiar with, and according to the setting of the original game, fiends were one of the ancient evils. If the ancient Calyptra was like a field raid boss, fiends were AI-controlled monsters that would appear every now and then to rule over tribes, and those tribes were considered more difficult enemies compared to tribes with no god, but its divinity level is lower than the ancient Calyptra, and he thought there were no stronger fiends to balance out the strength of the larger tribes that come with them. But since this is the real world, there should be some kind of a reason, and fiends sometimes grew as well. And there were players who lost the game when the fiends grew quite a bit by mid-game. But in the end, the only issue to be considered when targeting fiends was how much resources one could take from them without suffering losses, and in that regard, Nebula was perfectly ready. And Nebula was in a good mood because Rockrack's clan had gained XP, technical skills, and other resources without much loss. The resources gained this time would be enough to create a gap between himself and the other players, and since he believes that Rockrack has done enough, it's his turn to take over, and there was enough divinity accumulated, and it was a chance to use the new skill, the creature maker, and so he started to create his own creature. Outside of a handful of exceptions, once a small area reached level 4, it was possible to create a creature that would follow the god's will. The creature's strength, intelligence, and skills were all influenced by many factors such as the nature of the small area, the amount of faith points invested, the player's divinity level, and the resources used, and the abilities of the creature would rise, depending on the proportions of these factors. At this stage of creating a creature for the first time, Nebula currently had all the necessary resources to create a creature with the best abilities possible, and there probably aren't many players who've already created creatures. So Nebula was more excited than he should have, and Nebula actually preferred cuter looking creatures, but he decided not to go with that this time, because even if it's a slight difference, he needs to bet everything on practicality this time, because when seen in a statistical manner, Nebula knew which outer appearance had the strongest physical capabilities. He added appendages, elytra, and sturdy legs, which would get him some additional abilities, even though not much. For battle, the best form to have was to be standing rather than crawling. Then he added a mandible, sharp four legs, which could be used as a weapon, and tenors to prevent encountering sudden attacks, and big compound eyes which would allow it to see in all directions. At once, and with that he had finished making it, and it looks like a mantis, but it was a completely different organism. It wouldn't be able to fly due to its large size, but it had two more pairs of elytra that would allow it to glide in case of a sudden fall, and even more so for protection. Apart from the four legs that could be used as weapons, it also had a pair of hand-like body parts that could grasp things when needed, or break its opponents, but Nebula was also a man of style, so before he could save its appearance, 
he decided to add few minor thins you to fit with. His aesthetic, such as blue for its accent color, the same color he used when giving rack rack hints. Until now, but with a little darker shade. Also to make it shine clear and bright under the moonlight. The last step was to name it, and so Nebula combined two names that came to mind when he thought of. A mantis in the game, and just like that. Serratus was created from nothing. Now on to the present. Alloy was worshipping the two-headed fiend for its arrival, and this fiend was similar to a serpent. Which made it a kind of water snake. Serpents were strong enough to be compared to a drake on the ground, and it was fair to call them the top predators underwater. In addition to that, as a fiend that was divine, it had good levels of intelligence and divinity. However, this fiend wasn't aware that it had the potential to grow, and instead just ate things weaker than itself to satisfy its hunger. Shunan watched as the two-headed fiend approached the sacrifices, then it suddenly paused in hesitation. This was strange. The two-headed fiend always coveted the sacrifices as if it had been starving for days, but that didn't happen this time, and so Shunan looked at the fiend to know what the problem was. To his surprise, both its heads were now looking over his shoulders. This made him curious, so he went against the submissiveness toward the fiend that had been ingrained in him and turned around, following its gaze. Shunan instinctively froze as the only thing his eyes could see was a large monster looking down at them, and before he could utter any words, the monster steps onto the island and made its presence, which made the frogmen that were bowing to the two-headed fiend shot up and turned around, and with its presence there was no doubt to them that they were in the presence of another god, and so fear instilled to their eyes as they were in between the two gods. But even with this, they can't help but notice its length. The two-headed fiend was similar in size to Srathus, but Srathus, standing tall on the ground, made all the difference between the presence of the two, and Srathus's exoskeleton shined blue as it reflected the light from the torches. Anyone who saw the two-headed fiend would say it was just a shabby water snake in comparison to Srathus, which looked like a real god, and the two-headed fiend didn't know where that thing came from, but knew it couldn't back away now. That thing had invaded its territory, and if it just let it be, the two-headed fiend would have to give up the savages and the sacrifices that they offered. They belonged to the two-headed fiend, although the opponent seemed large and strong. The two-headed fiend knew that it itself was a divine being that could rule over all living things, and so the two-headed fiend pushed itself along the shore to slither onto the ground and attack its enemy. Its target was Srathus head. The two-headed fiend thought its widened maw would land on Srathus's head, but that didn't happen, as the arms that were folded in front of its body could clench things. Srathus reached out and clenched the head of one of the figures that tried to attack it. The two-headed fiend opened its other mouth as if it had been waiting to do so, but that was also useless. The sharp claw of Srathus foreleg squeezed in between. The fiend's tightly shut second mouth. Srathus grabbed its first head and yanked. The two-headed fiend tried to resist, but couldn't withstand Srathus's strength and ended up torn and split in the middle. The two heads fell in either direction, the snout that was the length of Srathus's arm, which was about ten meters long, was destroyed. The two-headed fiend then toppled backward with its spine revealed, shocking Oloi and his son. They couldn't even find a single word to say, as their god was split open in front of them. And the large mantis Srathus didn't help with their case, as it mumbled in a low voice, but that voice was also heard by the lizard men from all the way across the lake. But a proper battle hadn't even started. Srathus's next task was nothing but to kill the two-headed fiend completely. And so Srathus grabbed the fiend and cut a large chunk of its flesh into pieces while it was still alive. The pieces fell all around the frogman. Your sin is shoving forgiving with your blood from flesh. Even Nebula was a little surprised as he watched this happen. As he did think it would be a landslide victory for Srathus due to the differences in their levels and abilities, but still, he can't help but wonder if Srathus's skill was also a factor. And he was considering this, since the fiend's abilities weren't that bad. Given fiends were also gods. It had a small area, but it was a minor small area, rather than a 
major small area that all the players started with. That was why catching a fiend was a very important factor in the strategy known as small area farming, but the small area wasn't even used. In battle, it didn't seem like it even had a chance to use it since Srathus was too strong. So it seems like a greater D modifier made all the difference in terms of abilities. And the skill Srathus came with was indeed an ideal one, the supernatural strength. This is a tier 1 skill for a creature made for battle. It would dominate the other creatures. In the same rank if they fought. It's unfortunate that creatures made for battle become inferior. Going into the latter half of the game, but he hopes he didn't use up all his luck on something. Weird. Still, Nebula just decided to think positively about it. His goal of killing the two-headed fiend. Was achieved. All the frogmen had run away to the higher ranked village in panic. Leaving the lizardmen's sacrifices, and all the lizardmen cheered and cried out to the god. Enjoy. And just like before, they were thankful for the nameless beetle god to send a guardian. To aid them, while the grayish brown scaled lizard men that witnessed the miracle, especially Owen, collapsed to the ground with tears pouring down their faces. And with this, Nebula was pleased. One of the reasons was the status window that had just popped up. Just like with an abomination, one could acquire essence from fiends. Fiends were rarer, but it was more common for essence from abominations to grant physical advantages. Thus, creating a creature with a fiend's essence would require caution, so he didn't use it for now, and just went to the most important thing that he got right now, an unknown small area, which he didn't hesitate to accept, prompting him to receive a small area of the sea, which made Nebula unconsciously let out a burst of laughter. Because this is why the two-headed fiend couldn't use its full power. It had spawned on a lake where there is only fresh water, making it so that it couldn't use its given skill. But overall, it was a good thing that the two-headed fiend was easy to deal with. The only issue is he doesn't really need the small area C at the moment. Being able to control water was a very valuable ability to have, as bodies of water were divided into several categories, and the most valuable out of them were the seas and rivers. But the rivers would have been better. Even if the sea is okay. For the lizard men, who seem to have become nomads, things would be better balanced if his next tribe were a species that lives around a river. On the other hand, various conditions had to be met in order to make the best use of the sea, as they need to go out to the ocean to use this small area. But they're completely in the inland area right now, so going out to the ocean wouldn't be the best strategy. And so, while it was good to have obtained the small area, it was hardly something to be happy about. Still, it's okay. It's not completely useless and it'll be useful someday. And as he had been considering future strategies for a while, he then realized that Stratus was still at the Frogman village, and he didn't notice this sooner. Because, unlike with Divine Control, where Nebula would actually enter an individual's body and control them, less faith points were used to maintain Stratus. Additionally, it was possible for Nebula to summon Stratus whenever he needed, as well as calling it back and keeping it in a frozen state whenever he wished to. So, it was more likely for Nebula to summon Stratus rather than use divine control in the future. Whenever he wished to use physical force. Though divine control would be stronger considering. His divinity level would be applied, it is possible to use both if needed. But now that he got a good. Look at Stratus up close, he realized that he overdid it with the design, as he felt that Stratus was. A bit too fanatical and imposing. But there was no need to feel burdened about it. If the system of the Lost World was modeled after the real world, Stratus would be an everlasting friend to Nebula. That wouldn't ever betray him. But if he leaves Stratus out, the lizard men will be like that all night, which made Nebula smile wryly at the lizard men as he approached Stratus. And Nebula was unrecognizable to all beings on the planet, but Stratus could recognize Nebula as he was its creator. Once Nebula walked through the air and approached Stratus, Stratus spoke to Nebula, not literally, but in his mind. And Nebula thought the way it spoke to him was a little too respectful, but he let it be since. It suited it. And before he unsummons him, he praised Stratus for a job well done. And just. Like before it responded in a respectful manner talking how he will honor the will of his creator. 
again once the time comes. And as Nebula summoned it back, Stratus disappeared into the shadows. After that, the lizard men have calmed down now. However, having observed Rockrack from the beginning, Nebula knows too well that Rockrack is not the type of lizard man who does nothing in moments like this. And so he looked beyond the lake. And just like what he expected, Rockrack encouraged his warriors after he saw Stratus disappear. He told his people that today they will achieve a perfect victory, and he has checked that the island is empty. So they will swim there. They just need someone to guide them to the frogman's upper village. So he asked if there are any volunteers. At those words, Owen immediately approached Raycrack and volunteered to do it. He needs to get to the island to find his son anyways. So he will be the right man for the job. And Rockrack approved of this. But before they could depart, he noticed the other grayish brown scaled lizard men came up to him and politely asked to allow them to help him as well. But as Rockrack looked down at the lizard man talking to him, he noticed it was an old and injured lizard man. With this, he wasn't convinced to let them do what they pleased. And so he just get real with them and told them that he won't allow him to join, since it was obvious that he couldn't fight properly with that body. But the injured lizard was persistent and explained to Rockrack that he used to be a warrior. He is not one now, but warriors aren't the only ones who can kill frogmen. It may not be honorable. He can say it's cowardly for them to only do this now because there is a chance. He may also think going after someone who isn't a warrior is crossing the line, but seeing him and his men fight made him feel his heart burn. However, this burn didn't start today. It has been there for a long time. His heart's been burning since the day he became a slave to these frogmen. And Rockrack noticed a deep resentment burning in their eyes, a sentiment the lizard before him readily confirmed. It is indeed resentment and they need to let it out. This anger from losing his companion, his child, and his grandchild. He needs to pay it back in any way he can. And then Rockrack looked around at the other grayish brown lizard men. In his perspective, there weren't many who were holding a proper weapon, and they were all unhealthy. Not to mention hurt, and they were all scrawny because they hadn't been allowed to eat properly. And they were covered in many wounds from getting beaten that hadn't healed. It'll be hard for them to fight properly. The frogmen still have troops, and they also have bows and arrows. He doesn't wish for these hurt and exhausted lizard men to keep getting hurt, or even die. If they fight, at least one of them will definitely meet such fate. It might even be a safer battle for him if only him and his warriors pursue the frogmen. But who is he to stop them? He knew that he has no authority to take away their rights, the right to be angry, and the right to take revenge. And so Rockrack then shouted to all the grayish brown lizard men who wanted to take revenge to follow him, as they should never give up on their right, and at Rackrick's words, they all raised their weapons and cheered. The warriors submerged into the water first, and fifty more. Avengers followed. Eighty lizard men swam across the lake with their snouts above the water. After they made it to the island, the parent of the young ones bolted to their children to embrace them. And Owen was one of them. Finally their dream came true, so they cherished this moment even more. And Rackrack was glad that everything went well for them. But just as Rackrack predicted, there were about ten lizard men who were exhausted from the trip, so they took the children on boats and returned to the lower village. Jal directed the healthy lizard men to examine the injured and make them rest. Rackrack put the lizard men who couldn't swim well onto the remaining boats and had you direct them to go far around the upper village. After that, you were asked if he plans to attack the frogmen from both sides, to which Rackrack confirmed, because he knows too well that the frogmen will be keeping an extra eye out on the lake. But now that they aren't short on numbers, they can divide into two groups. And this tactic had a purpose to trick their adversaries. As the forty men he is taking can't fight well, but the frogmen will be disoriented if they show up in the dark. And once they're distracted, he will take their warriors and attack them by the lake. However, this is such a risky move even for Rackrack, so you couldn't help but be worried for him. So he asked Rackrack if he will be alright, and with confidence, 
Rakrak responded that he will be. Even though there are fewer than ten of them that can properly fight in his group. He had discovered another blessing God has given them while they were swimming to this island. This surprised you, so he immediately asked Rakrak what it was, out of pure excitement. To which Rakrak gladly explained to him that their scales are black. And they will glimmer. Under the moonlight the way water glimmers. With this, they will surely see the end sooner than later, and Rakrak's predictions were correct. All the fighting that happened at the upper village. When his Rakrak had planned. The frogmen were in complete shock to see the lizard men were already right in front of them, as they couldn't even see them coming. And they were completely in disarray as soon as they saw the numerous lizards rushing to them at both sides. With this, the frogmen panic, and therefore they were easily overpowered by the lizards. Aloy couldn't even grasp what was happening after coming out of his hut, but what is clear is that the tribe leader of the lizard men is easily killing his well-trained warriors with ease. And without any other options, Yuloi called out to his god and asked it to save him. As he had sacrificed so much just to serve him. But his god didn't answer. And Rakrak's spear just penetrated his skull killing him in an instant. Meanwhile, Shunan bolted as soon as he witnessed his father Aloy getting stabbed several times with a spear. To his death. He was indeed a coward through and through, and so he hid himself inside a hut. While his men died one by one, he heard their scream and plea for their leader to step in and guide them. But his coward ass couldn't even move his legs no more, so he stayed at one spot, hoping that this would just end. But as time passed, desperate, and with nothing else to do but stay put, his mind was filled with questions, and so he cried out to his dead god, but his dead god, who is now cut into many pieces didn't answer. And so Shunan was left in the dark just waiting for something to happen, and he wasn't confident to go out, since the healthy frogman had already run away from the village, and the only frogman getting caught by the lizard men were those afflicted with the itching disease, and thus had trouble breathing. Still, he was trying to hold on to hope. So he was thinking that even if his enemy has more warriors, they have way more people. There are some men that have the disease but can still fight, and there are also lots of men that are old but still have the energy to shoot arrows. If they could just buy some time to get their selves together, they would have a chance to fight back. But Shunan soon realized there wasn't really anyone to do that. His father Aloy was a brave warrior back in his heyday, but from some point. To be exact, from the day the two-headed fiend awoke from the lake, Aloy had become enchanted by the two-headed fiend's prowess. As long as sacrifices were offered, the two-headed fiend granted anything that Aloy wished to do, and through that Aloy was able to eliminate his competitors, drive out hostile tribes, and defeat cockatrices. This seemed like a good deal at first. But once Aloy stopped doing things on his own, and instead had his god do everything for him, he became less and less like a warrior. Since everyone had learned the qualities of a warrior from Aloy, the frogman who should have become courageous actually learned how to deceive others and act weak. They've all become cowards, and he became one as well. However, it was too late of a realization. Shunan wanted to run out and tell the frogmen to not be scared, and that they still had a chance. He could picture himself shooting arrows into the heads of the lizard men and leading the frogmen to turn the tides, but it was all nothing but fantasy. Shunan hid in a hut as he saw the lizard men warriors running nearby. The black-scaled lizard men were faster and more agile than he was. So he wouldn't be able to run away. He listened quietly to the last of the screams that the frogmen were letting out before taking a look outside, making sure no one was there. But as he did this, a lizard man already took notice of the hut he was hiding at and was now behind him. Which startled Shunan, so he whirled around, and unconsciously reached toward his quiver to grab an arrow, but he had already wasted them all. He had successfully shot a few into some lizard men. But none of the wounds he inflicted were fatal, and the poisonous frogs were useless. This was the consequence of relying on poison. It became a habit to aim at body parts that weren't vital, and then the shadow revealed its face. It was Rakrak, and he was there to end him. But as a warrior himself, he told Shunan to get up and draw his sword, as he will allow him to at least keep his honor. But just like before, Shunan was a coward, 
so instead of doing what Rakrak said, he just groveled in the ground and asked Rakrak to spare him, but he is not planning to do that. He wanted to erase every frogman from their village, but even before he could set things straight with Shunan, Shunan revealed a rather pitiful aspect of his character. He resorted to an obvious lie, claiming that they have built their friendship over the last few times they met. And he have no ill feelings towards them lizard men. They were just threatened by the two-headed fiend. But his pathetic attempts hadn't convinced Rakrak, so Shunan racked his brain for words. With this, he decided to tell him a secret, and just as expected, he noticed a sudden change. On Rakrak's face, showing that he was intrigued by it. And so he tells Rakrak that he will reveal to him the way to make a bow, especially about the material of the bowstring, but before he tells him he needs to promise that he will let him live. But even before he could state his proposal, Rakrak told him to get straight to the point. Shunan then realized he wasn't in the position to bargain, and so he did what he was told, revealing to Rakrak that they're made out of the tendons in men's backs. And Rakrak was immediately convinced, he knew it would be the tendons of some kind of animal, but something always seemed off, because they could only make this if the tendons belonged to those who walked on two feet, as it would be the only suitable materials to make a bow long enough for the frogman. This lead Rakrak to ask Shunan from which species were the back tendons used to make their bows, and as soon as Rakrak asked this, Shunan realized the grave mistake that he had made. But there was no turning back now, and lying wasn't an option either. So with a frustrated expression, he answered that it was from the lizard men. With that, Rakrak tilted his head, causing his face to be hidden in the shadows again. Only Rakrak's eyes were shining, and Shunan had no clue what Rakrak was thinking, but now Shunan was prepared for death. He knew he couldn't recover from that, and any reason that he could say would just be meaningless, so he just bowed his head and waited for his inevitable death to come. However, the words that came out of Rakrak's mouth were unexpected, instead of killing him on the spot. Rakrak just permits him to go, even though he believes that it's questionable if there's really any grace or resentment between them. But he has already achieved a perfect victory. And Shunan also offered a deal, so he accepted it as a fair trade, and if that wasn't convincing, Enough, Rakrak stepped aside from the entrance of the hut. With this, Shunan hurriedly ran away. Afraid that Rakrak might change his mind, so he didn't even realize there was a familiar lizard man next to Rakrak, and as Shunan was running frantically, Owen then asked Rakrak if he's really just letting him go, to which Rakrak confidently responded that he is. Because he needs a moving target. Rakrak had been thinking he should slowly begin practicing with moving targets. He thought of the trick Owen had taught him before, and that is before releasing the bowstring. He has to hold his breath and look directly at the target. It was hard for Rakrak to understand at first, and he thought it was a fake trick. But when he was practicing his bow skills with Shunan, he used this technique and made a direct hit on the plank. Even Shunan was impressed, and if he practices more, Shunan thinks that he will be good as his warriors. This puzzled Rakrak, as he had hit the middle of the target, so he doesn't get why it wasn't enough. And so Shunan clarified that what he did is not all there is to a bow. He has both strength and accuracy, but he takes too long to fire an arrow. In response, Rakrak clarified that he only did this, since he believes that he should inflict fatal wounds precisely rather than roughly hitting them. This remark of his only made Shunan laugh, as he thinks that Rakrak's reason was expected from a guy who hadn't used a bow in combat, so he pointed out to Rakrak that in actual combat, the target moves. Slowing down or stopping the target comes first. The final blow is what comes after, and this was a sound explanation, so Rakrak made sure to remember it and seeing that Rakrak seems to trust him more. Shunan being the slide bastard that he was, he told Rakrak with enthusiasm in his voice that if they truly become friends, he will also teach him how to make a bow, because the ingredients could also be acquired by a lizard man quite easily. However, there was a hint of malice in his tone. Even the other frogman who was with him couldn't even contain their smile. As Shunan had said this, but Rakrak haven't got a clue on what it was before, but now that he does, 
Rakrak's irritation and anger towards Shunan intensified more than ever, and so it only took a moment to let go of the bowstring, and using the trick that Owen taught him. The arrow released. From the bow passed through both of Shunan's ankles, and Shunan fell to the ground in an unsightly manner, and the grayish-brown lizard men who were waving their bloody wooden clubs around and searched for a target to take revenge on, heard Shunan scream, and without hesitation, they rushed towards him, intent on carrying out acts of unimaginable cruelty, the kind that only arises from the darkest depths of the human mind. They were meticulous in ensuring he remained alive. Throughout, driven by the belief that a swift death would be too merciful for him. After that, ordeal was over, a few days had passed, and Rakrak was still practicing his archery. By shooting the head of a frogman that was tied up and rotting, he had used it as a target for a long time, and as he was about to go for another strike, Owen who was beside him commented that the quality of the new bow seems to have improved considerably, as it was now able to fly as far as the bows the frogman used, and they preferred to use a new bowstring. Even though the previous one was a good bow that could be used for a long time, but after what they found out from Shunan, they couldn't use the old bows anymore, as it was still made from one of their fallen brothers and sisters, and they believed that they can always make another bow, until they find a better way to make bows than the frogman did. They're going to use the back tendons of the frogman to make bows in the meantime, but with the new string attached, Rakrak was dissatisfied, because if one pulls a little more, the bow will break. So it would be nice to have material to strengthen the bow, but the problem is, they couldn't find stronger materials in the area that they were in, so it seems like he can't just stay in this forest, but his reasons is not only to make a better bow. As he had learned from the stargazer that this mountain area would become very cold once winter came, the lizard men would become physically weaker, but they could endure the winter by making fires and wearing leather. However, the buffaloes that Rakrak's clan had were the problem, since water buffaloes of the wilderness would go to warmer places to avoid the winters, where there would still be grass. So few of them really have to leave to raise the water buffaloes, and the water buffaloes had already given birth once and were adjusting well. As time passed, the herd would get large and become a long-term food source for the lizard men, just as you had initially envisioned, with that explained. Rakrak continued with his archery training, but Owen wasn't beside Rakrak to see him practice, but rather he was here to do his duty as a new warrior of their clan, and that is to report that they have finally exterminated the frogmen wandering around their area. This was a problem they had for a few weeks, even though many frogmen had died. There were more frogmen who had run away, and Rakrak guessed there were about more than 1,000 of them, as there was a limit to how many frogmen the 30 warriors and grayish-brown lizard men could kill in one night, and so, with the help of Owen and JL's intelligence, Rakrak devised a plan to exterminate the frogmen who are just loitering around near their village, and Rakrak doesn't plan on capturing them and turn them into slaves, like how the frogmen did, even though it would be logical if they did that. And he believes that might even be their justifiable right since they fought and won. However, they have already seen the frogmen become weak once because of it, so they can't do that again. With this reasoning, Owen realized how incredible of a leader Rakrak truly is. It wasn't simply because the god Rakrak believed in was strong, because Rakrak was still going to fight the two-headed fiend even if his god wasn't there to help him. He would have fought even if there was no miracle, and he would have done so, even if he wasn't the tribal chief or a warrior. The courage he has to fight may be the reason why he is who he is today, and Rakrak not only tried to cautiously approach the frogmen, but he did the same with the grayish-brown lizard men. To Rakrak it seemed that the grayish-brown lizard men had also been ruled by another tribe, just like what happened to the blue-scaled lizard, but even though they had warmed up to the other lizard men, they still were a bit wary toward Rakrak's tribe as a whole once their desires for revenge had calmed down, as they've experienced the horror of being controlled by a bigger group. And Rakrak wanted to protect the grayish-brown lizard men, and were welcoming them into their fold. But this is different from what happened with the other blue-scaled lizard as it was there. First time seeing this tribe, they also have about 200 lizard men, which is quite a lot. Not to mention, their culture is very different, and in addition to that, they have an experience of being tricked 
by simple courtesy, so a method like that wouldn't work. With this, Rack Rack was deeply troubled about how to go about it, but surprisingly, the answer came from the grayish brown lizard men themselves. When Owen was reporting what had happened while he was hunting the remaining frogmen, Jail was walking towards them but stopped as she had noticed a young lizard man hiding behind the trees, and so she approached the youngling to ask him why he is hiding. But this just gave the little one a mini heart attack, and before the little lizard could respond, Joel took notice of the item the little one had dropped. This sparked curiosity in her, so she took it to take a closer look. It seems like a well-crafted wood sculpture of their guardian, so she immediately went to Rack Rack and showed it to him, and Rack Rack was also surprised, as he thinks it's beautiful and nicely made, which made the little one happy, and so he willfully gave it to the tribal leader. And initially, Rack Rack was hesitant, so he asks the little one if he is sure. The kid didn't respond properly as he was just happy to see the tribe leader, but Owen told him it will be okay. Because among the children in their village these days, making and exchanging things like this has become popular. To confirm what Owen was saying, Joel asked the kid if other children in his village have many of these as well, which the kid enthusiastically confirmed, and that is because the guardian who saved them is really a magnificent and great being. The kid's feeling is akin to a child adoring a superhero, but that superhero is real, and by the looks of it, this was the answer. That Rack Rack was searching for, a way for them to connect with the new tribe members, the grayish brown lizard man, and with the approval of his wife, Rack Rack told Owen that he wished he had more of this stuff, which Owen gladly responded that he will help him look for more in the village. And with that, Shine filled Rack Rack eyes once again, as he had overcome another problem. But before they could do that, Rack Rack asked Owen to continue his report that was interrupted earlier, and so Owen did just that, as he was tracking down a group of frogmen, which he ordered. Two. They were led to cave that the frogmen were hiding in. It takes about half a day to get there. From the lake, they killed all of them without much trouble, but the cave was a bit strange. And as expected, Rack Rack showed interest in what Owen had said, so he asks him to explain further. And so Owen did just that. As they went into the cave, they noticed there was another entrance. That seemed to have been carved out, but he is not sure how they carved the hard rock. And so Rack Rack was hooked to check it out himself. Rack Rack took Owen and Jail and went down to the village. Rack Rack thought it was something worth checking out, but Nebula already knew what it was. It's an ancient ruin, and he was contemplating if it is okay now to traverse an ancient ruin. But contrary to Nebula's worries, Rack Rack already seemed interested. Rack Rack had been exposed to too many things ever since he was young to turn down an adventure. Rack Rack had lost both his parents when he was a child, so he had to grow up without anyone's help. And he had also fought a saber-toothed tiger to protect his tribe at the time when they had gotten kicked out into the wilderness. And all of the other things after that, Rack Rack's life had been full of excitement. He didn't think of a new adventure as something dangerous, but rather as a trigger that could change the future. And thus, as the next day arrived, Rack Rack and Jail started their journey, and were accompanied by six additional warriors. Owen was also with them as their guide. Meanwhile, Nebula was a little worried. Because he knows that the ancient ruins are a little different than his followers expected. And they might be disappointed of it. Unlike the fiends and abominations who appeared according to a player's divinity level, locations of ancient ruins were already set at the beginning of the game, which meant that the difficulties of the challenges were also predetermined. Therefore, at this stage of the game, it wouldn't be surprising for Rack Rack to be stopped at the entrance to the ancient ruin without even the chance to give the challenge a go, due to not meeting the challenge requirements, commonly known as an invisible wall. But even in that case, it's still worth discovering an ancient ruin, even if it may be useless right now. Rack Rack has lots of interest in writing, so his clan or their descendants may discover it later on. There were a few kinds of things that could be obtained just by successfully entering ancient ruins. First, there's ancient knowledge. Ancient knowledge was also known as ancient technology. It was called ancient, but in the game The Lost World, ancient things were comparable to things in the most modern and advanced civilizations. Entering these kinds of ancient ruins could yield advanced knowledge and technology that had degenerated over time. 
but usually it isn't even possible to get past the entrance if the level of civilization is too low. No matter what, the doors to an ancient ruin would never open accidentally, and in many cases, required various archaeological knowledge on technology of the era right before the era of the ancient ruin. Nebula actually thought of these ancient ruins as technology farming. Dungeons made for the progression of the game, so there's no need for ancient knowledge to be given in ruins at this stage of time. So then the only possibility would be that the ruins will give rank knowledge or skills, just like livestock farming and agriculture, being able to obtain knowledge and technology. Indicated that the level of civilization was still low. Knowledge and technology would eventually be developed over time, so it wasn't necessary to discover an ancient ruin, but acquiring various kinds of knowledge and technology never hurt. And at the moment, it seems like rank knowledge would be the best to have. That way, it would also be possible to adequately raise Rakraks, Gels, or Owen's XP, obtaining something did feel good, but what was obtained could be difficult to use at times, just like mystery. Among the ancient ruins, there were cases where the ruins themselves had special powers. These special powers included automatically creating special resources, colonies of particular organisms being formed, converting certain resources to other resources, cursing, or blessing the surrounding areas, or applying a status effect to a tribe or species that think they have ownership of the ruin. Mysteries themselves are good most of the time. The only problem is most mysteries are predetermined. It'll be hard for Rakrak's clan to properly utilize a mystery as they're already thinking of life. Stock farming. Splitting the clan wasn't a problem, but their geographical location was. Mysteries weren't always good, and Nebula had already led Rakrak's clan into the inner part of the peninsula, far away from the other players. Even if the mystery was on the good end, it would be hard to properly utilize it. When beginners obtain a mystery, they try to somehow change their builds to take advantage of it, but in reality, mysteries rarely play a significant role in winning the game. Nebula always believed in the statistics of the lost world, and there was another thing that he wished he wouldn't get other than these mysteries, and that is a demonic ruin. Getting into the ruin wouldn't be too bad as long as it wasn't that kind of ruin. But upon reaching the entrance, Rakrax and Jael noticed that the inscriptions were similar to those on the golden tablet they had previously acquired, promptly. They decided to open the entrance. And despite the door's weight, Rakrax managed to move it, as the door opened, revealing what lay. Beyond, an entity on the other side was suddenly awakened. This being greeted them with a chilling. Welcome to a realm that Nebula had hoped didn't exist, a demonic world. And here stairs seemed to descend endlessly into the depths, while flashes of lightning sporadically illuminated the ominous space. 